<laughs> and uh, and one of them is uh, is a race trailer. Um, my son used to race in uh, professional motorcycle racing, uh, the Moto America series, things like that. We did that from the age of he was he started dirt bikes at like eight years old, and we raced till he was eighteen, or we did 10, 11 years of it, or something. Wow. Uh, he subsequently got out of it, and I was totally fine with it. I mean, I, my nerves couldn't take it anymore anyway. Uh, um, and so what I did was I restored and completely built out his final motorcycle, which is what you see in the background there. That was his final um, Moto America Super Sport race bike. It's a, a 2014 MV Augusta F3675. That's exactly what that is. Wow, so, wow it's, it's a beautiful got all bike. The, it's got all the Corsa parts on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it, if I totaled it up and I scare myself when I do this, but it's 40 grand to build one of these bikes. And we oh, yeah. had two. Yeah, so, no, I have, my buddy's got a, yeah. uh, a Ducati. He, he races for, he, he does uh, endurance racing. So okay. he, he, he's, they've raced Lamborghini. He won his, he won his category last year. And Lamborghini cool. agreed to give him a new car, but uh, the other thing that he has is a, is a motorcycle, and uh, he took me into his little store, and it's an indoor carpeted room with his Ducati in there. Oh, yeah, my. we hold these things in pretty high regard. I've got a, I've got a couple of Ducatis, and I have a uh, Moto Guzzi, which you don't see very often. Um, and so, yeah, we treasure them, but I mean, this is like my kids rolling museum is what you're, what you're basically looking at. And it, it's got a brand new fresh engine in it, oh, but it'll never run again. I'm not, I'm not interested in, in that. I just want to have, I'll have that carpeted room that you're speaking of and that's where it'll end up. Awesome. So you mean it's just going to be sitting there for you to look at and you're never going to start the engine up going and you're never going to drive well, it on the street or anything like that? No, it's, it's actually there for me and all you guys to look at now. So, <laughs> oh wow, very cool. It, it yeah, yeah. It, well, I I built his bike. So this th when we last stopped riding, he had actually had some engine troubles with this bike, and so I tore it down and rebuilt it back to factory fresh. And then he didn't he wasn't really interested in racing anymore, and it was a seriously expensive endeavor as it was anyway. And I was okay with it. You know, he he did it for ten years. He got out of it without serious injuries. Um, and I was, I was good. He learned a lot from it, from the experience, you know, but yeah. he's a great kid. He's, he's a go-getter and, you know, racing will teach you stuff like that. You bet. Well, that's really cool. Ernie, are you in anyway, let me introduce, let me interrupt you a little bit. Let me say hello to everybody who is tuning yeah. in right Hi. now. Welcome well, everybody yeah. to thinking out loud with friends. Uh, today's we're calling it what you've got to be kidding me. So there's <laughs> the title of the show. I so now you know where it comes. This is from. one you be nine, me. man. 199 i can't believe it when we started this uh and covid i never thought it would last you know as long as it has but it's one of my avocations and i love it and I, even though i have to wake up at six o'clock in the morning to join you guys at five o'clock in the afternoon i hate daylight savings time ah anyway going on with just remember everything you hear today is an opinion we have a we have a new guest today uh, a new member on the panel uh bernie broderick and Bernie, you can introduce yourself or not, or and then we'll we'll talk about what we want to talk about. I believe uh, I don't want to I don't want to blow your intro. <laughs> no, there's I, no I've intro. only heard there's amazing no things about you. There's no spoilers. There's no spoilers. Um, no, I mean I I uh, I've been I've been working around this industry for quite a few. Uh oh, we got muted here. He got muted somehow. That's one of the problems we're using the iPhone. Uh, I'm, I'm, he, he, he. Are you there, Bernie? You're muted. Yeah, Bernie, you we lost me. Bernie's Bernie, audio. You, you just got muted. Yeah, and it's 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 probably your 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 AirPods, uh, probably just lost their battery, I guess. So what I did, Bernie, I just had the same issue. I don't know if you're on a computer or on an iPad, but I touched my own video and then I muted myself and then unmuted myself and that got me back. Oh, now he's muted. Now he's muted. Now let's, then let's unmute and working any better. No, doesn't look okay, like so it. what's happened, what, what's probably happened is he's lost his Bluetooth connection with the AirPods on the computer. That's what you should, that's what you should look into. And I'm sure you'll come back in with us at any moment in time. 
Well, while we're waiting for Bernie, let me just keep going on and saying, hey, so everything you hear today is an opinion. Make sure you do your own research. You're more than welcome to join us. I highly recommend that anybody on the panel tags themselves on the show on either Facebook or, or YouTube or LinkedIn, and uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, today, I got uh, amazing news, and I did not know this, but our YouTube stats, we have 1.2 thousand views uh, of 30 minutes. That's blowing my mind. And then on the activity aspect, last week on LinkedIn, we had 336 impressions of the show. And we have now 3,356 followers. And you know what the most amazing part is? Not one comment, not a comment. Nobody says anything. So what's going on out there with you? Hey, you know? I... <laughs> unbelievable no comments you know be careful what you wish for because you just might get it you know yeah, well, so bernie are you back can we hear you now no no i i don't know what kind of computer you're on but whatever it is what i would do is is shut your mic shut the uh air the bluetooth off and go to the uh, if you're on a mac use the mac use the mac uh use the use the mac microphone That's what I would do. Shut the Bluetooth off, and just use the uh, you use just you or take your AirPods out, uh, 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 AirPad, AirPad, AirPods out, and put them back in the yeah, case. Take the iPad out of your ear and place the. <laughs> oh, if you're on an iPad, you can use the iPad <laughs> no, speaker, no, just, uh, the iPad just, speaker, okay. and the microphone will be fine. Yeah, you, uh, that's what you. that's what Greg does, right, Greg? All right. <laughs> okay. Yes. Let's talk about the bears again. What the hell's going on around here? You know. So anyway, I I I I just wanted to report. You know, coming from Las Vegas, the way I do. Steve Lawrence died at eighty-eight. You know, him and Edie Gourmet. You know, they were they were a pair. All right. I got to see them perform a few times, and of course, they used to hang out on the telethon and stuff. So for all you old timers, you know. Also, you know who else passed away this week? Eric Carmen, who was the lead singer of the Raspberries, and he had the, the hit uh, All By Myself and Hungry Eyes. He was 74, so R.I.P. Yep, big R. I. big there. Cleveland guy. Yeah. Now, there you are. No. So, Greg, you, you, you use the microphone on your iPad, right, and the speakers? Right, yep. Okay. That's all I, so I use. I, uh, when it comes up for the microphone, it says... Do you want to use Wi-Fi for your audio? And I say, sure. And okay. that's it. Bernie, you back? Yeah, Bernie, you, you, I think you may need to exit the Zoom call and then come back in in order to get the new audio settings. All right. Well, anyway, he'll be back. Uh, in the meantime... So um, we talk, we were talking about NASA offline, but the reason why that picture in our logo is because uh, NASA's mission, which is slated for October, will send the spacecraft to Jupiter's moon Europa. And they have figured out that it is possible that there is a life there because they believe that there's water there and an ocean. And so uh, I, I don't know if people could live in that horrible uh, you know, environment, but I'm telling you, I was swimming there once. It was there. terrible. It was cold. <laughs> yeah, and the portions were small. Unbelievable. Yeah, God, and no, the, no. Oh, the food, the deal. food, the hotel was a disaster. <laughs> the hotel was a disaster. Yeah, the hotel, Europa, it was. Yeah, the Europa Hotel, obviously, you know, I'm, on Europa. I'm, and uh, I'm giving them a bad rating on Airbnb. That's for sure. <laughs> you know. <laughs> It'll never, you know, yeah, I want my money back, I tell you, you know. I'm in an Airbnb right now, which is really quite nice here in a city called Hua Hin, spelled H-U-A-H-I-N. You could Google map it. It's really nice up the coast. Up the coast. Okay, two, we two got Bernie back. Now you back. just have to unmute yourself, and I think you're good. Oh. Nope. Well, we got to keep moving. I wish Bernie, I wish I, um, I can't figure out what's going on with Bernie from here, but I'm sure he's a smart guy. He's going to figure it out. He will. So anybody watch the Oscars? 
A little yes. tiny bit, Jan. A little tiny no. bit. Yeah, I did. It was think... I, I liked it actually. And uh, how come your video's not on, Greg? There it is. I was yeah, I there was, you are. I was laying down uh, on the couch. So <laughs> you handsome son of a bitch. You know, we want to look at you. You know, that's it. <laughs> no, I like the Oscars actually. I thought it was really well done. Uh, uh, if you think you if you think they, you're they, one in a million, Greg, there were 19 more of you watching at the same time. 19.5 yeah. million viewers. I thought it was pretty cool. I mean, I like I like that uh, that Ryan Gosling uh, music number. Yeah, uh, I am Ken. I thought yeah. it was good. Yeah, I'm not what, really what sure the, what's uh, going on with Billie Eilish. Membership? I don't I, I don't get the love of Billie Eilish. And maybe somebody else can tell me. You've got a great you know, voice. Uh, Very it just seems like that kind of ballad stuff is not for me. Yeah, but she a... also sang a uh, last year. She uh, she got one for uh, the James Bond movie, or maybe two years ago she got it. Yeah, she's pretty amazing. I mean, I mean, she's you know come a come a long way in a really short period of time. Her and her brother, they're pretty amazing. I mean, you know, um, mm -hmm. it's uh, it she's done well. She's done well. Ah, I tell you, I tell you what, with that, uh, um, with that uh, song that she sang at the Oscars, that would be hell to do live. You know, if you're doing it like an arena tour with it, like just right. breathless. You know. Well, that's how all her songs are. Yeah. So the but orchestra still, that. Sorry, Greg. Carry on. No, I just said. Uh, yeah, the, the signal to noise ratio was uh, had to be cranked up. So, yeah, yeah well, it I must be hard to, to the... mix her. So I was listening to the start, Dan. Uh, so I haven't. I mean, I'm going to watch the whole thing, but I watched about half an hour at the end because I was and and I saw a bit of the stuff, but I was too tired. I was going to watch the whole thing, mm -hmm. and um, but I was in the. The band is live, isn't it? The orchestra is live mm -hmm. uh, in another room. Is that correct? I yeah, was actually in a balcony above the stage. Yeah, radio. I was impressed, and I know we're listening to the telly, uh, and it goes through many, many electrons to get to where I am. But I was impressed with the detail and the smoothness of the um, of the band playing. Uh, I didn't hear any of the performances. I'm just talking about the one, whether it's a backing track or whatever, I don't know, but I thought it was the a live band because it was an orchestra as the, I, it was. Yeah, I may be incorrect, but I think Mix Mobile did that. That Jan, do you know who did the uh, uh, the mobile for the? Uh, uh, I for do the... not know, but I am, I, I would be very surprised if Mike Abbott wasn't involved in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, A2K, the the that they they they've been involved in it. I mean, look, this is the number one show of its kind, uh, the right. granddaddy of them all, and they've got the best people working on on right. on it for sure. You know, the quality. Yeah, David would definitely. know. I think. You know, if David pops in, he'd probably know. But I think yeah. you know um, David should probably pop in. I think David is David's available. Kenny should be. Kenny's probably on his way right now to to uh, Las Vegas uh, to do Manilow this week. Uh, Kurt just texted me. He's going to be coming in again in a um, few minutes. He's checking into the hotel, so he'll be he'll be live with us shortly. And then, of course, when is David you know, going on his cruise? Do you remember? Is it next I don't, week? Um, no, not next. I think it's not till next uh, till the middle of the middle of the month. Oh, okay. Because yeah, just he a did. huge rock, a, a huge rock and roll cruise just just finished up. I know a couple people that were on on that one. Um, yeah, I would think, you know, it's a moneymaker, you know, those kind of things, because, the, you know, that's the perfect people who are, you know, uh, looking forward to get away. And then they like the music, you know, of our generation. So, yeah, they've got the money to do it. And then, you know, cruising is big. And some of these new ships are are, are, are really floating, you know, megatropolises. They're mm -hmm. not even cities anymore. They can handle 8,000 people or something crazy like that. You know, go figure. It's nuts. So speaking of nuts, 
this is an amazing statistic. This was on NBC News and uh, from a Gallup poll. And basically they're saying now women ages 18 to 26, which would be Gen Z, nearly 30 of them, 30% identify themselves as LGBTQ. That's a, I mean, that is insane that 30% of, of, of Gen Z women are, are not that there's anything wrong with it. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that it's really changed since I was a kid, you know, or maybe not. Maybe they yeah, just didn't have a lot of, in those days. There, Can you guys finally hear me, by the way? Yay! Yes, we hear you. Yes, Yay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so to answer all your questions, I was, I was in the trail. I was on a MacBook. And for whatever reason, I could not change the microphone, no matter what I selected or what I did, I was not getting any microphone input into the into the computer at all. So I had to do a last minute, grab some stuff, come into the shop and get it going in here. And I get all the way in here and I get I get it all set up here and it says, you have to go back to the other device to allow that to be changed over to this device. So I run back out to the trailer again. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know how it goes. But um, I've used this computer many times to do this, so I'm sure we'll be fine from here. Well, there you go. Um, and welcome. Welcome. Ken Porter just came into the room. Uh, I just got text from Kurt Hare. He's on his way. So, Bernie, Excellent. you were just about to introduce yourself. So go ahead. Take it. Take Come back. Come back. Kinda like him. Come I'm, back. I'm, I'm, kind, I'm kind of I'm, I'm maybe obscure to some people, but uh, people, a lot of people, including Ken, um <laughs> we've been we've been around each other for a minute um yeah so i've spent my entire life in the in this industry you know and ken and ken knows me best from back in the L acoustics days and then onward through eaw so i worked a lot of years with manufacturers and uh, i was watching the 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 clock kind of ticking away on my career and about uh four years ago i decided i just wanted to break away and and do something on my own you know make that my swan song instead of um you know getting the watch and the swift kick in the in the pants going out the door kind of thing so uh yeah so a uh, long career in audio owned a sound company myself for a number of years originally from canada um you know front of house sound engineer for years uh manufacturers you know employee for many years with l acoustics and eaw um and now here i am doing my own thing so tell us what it is you know what is it you're doing and uh, i think that your company is called TCM is that what you call the company? No, the company's called Truth and Audio. Um, oh, Truth the, and Audio. Yeah, well, yeah. What the is product, TCM then? Product that that you guys kicked in on a, in a conversation there a week or so ago is called TCM, and that's oh. uh, that's one of the products that I've got out right now. And so basically, uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to do Truth and Audio, as I just explained, is I just wanted to have a maybe very varied swan song, and. Um, I wanted to create some stuff that was that was kind of maybe I, I saw needing or lacking or or whatever in the industry. And when of course when you work for a big brand or something like that, um, you, your ideas are are are, are shared, um, valued, but not necessarily relevant to the company and the company's business. So sometimes you just got to put your money where your mouth is and go out and try things on your own. And um, and hopefully introduce something or maybe many things into the market that are all of a sudden needed. Um, and so that's that's basically what I've done with Truth and Audio is tried to create a company that makes unique stuff, you know, like not looking for the big mass market windfall or anything like that. Just want to have some fun. So tell me, what is it now you're, you're working on a project that has network switches? Is that correct? Yeah, so so I was going to say this when we were just, we were noodling around before you started the broadcast. Um, so... I, I'm actually I'm the UI guy in this in this TCM product category. So I'm the user interface guy. I don't do the electronics. That's uh, that's handled by others. And um, and so my whole concept and idea was after you know many years of touring, being introduced into network PAs originally back in 2012. You know when we were coming up with the EAW Anya system. Um, I got thrown in the deep end of of networking sound systems and and working on that stuff, and that was all well and good. Um, as the as the as time went on, and I started having more and more opportunities to be on the show site, out with crews and everything, um, I started to just kind of formulate this opinion that maybe maybe we haven't addressed networking from a hardware 
um, aspect. We've done lots of digital electronic, you know, uh, advancement with networks. They do crazy, crazy things and and really, really help us. But I, I, I wasn't seeing um, anybody really take up the the charge to say, how do we actually use this stuff in the field? How do we carry it? How do we hook it up? Because a lot of guys that I would work with on the road were all being introduced to this at the same time. You know, I'm, most of us here are probably still like an NLA kind of guy. You know, I just want to plug in my speaker cabinet and have it turn on. And, and that's very, very real. And the roadblock that I was seeing was nobody had really kind of distilled this down from a from a stage hand or a, or an audio crew or whatever from their perspective to work on how I can interface myself with this stuff. How easy can I can I put this stuff together? How repeatable is it? How many accessories and options do I have with doing networking? Because if you strip all that out, what you're left with is either something sitting on top of a road case or something that you had to build at the shop in a rack. And you had to vet out the cables and do all that sort of stuff, which is all well and good if it's it's a fixed rack. But what what I did with TCM was I put all that in a box, you know, put everything in a, in a case, a little case, and um, and it basically is like a grab and go utility that you can use for you know whatever networking applications you may have. And then uh, came up with a bunch of accessories you know, ways to attach it to sound systems, um, rack sleeves that you could put the stuff in, um, C-clamps that you can attach to it and hang it from a truss if you need to do distributed networking around a truss. And all of this in, I guess, in one way or another could be handled in a proprietary fashion inside of a production company with some chops, you know, they can, they can do these things, but nothing is in the market that could just do it all. You know, you could just buy it, get the accessories and just go out and do it, um, whatever you, you needed to do. I originally started it with an unmanaged switch because I really wanted to make it super simple for guys doing like Dante and stuff like that. And then uh, ultimately through some persuasion, market persuasion, developed a uh, AVP Milan version, which I guess that's what Kurt and you guys were talking about when I saw the video was about the Meyer Panther rig and things like that. And so, um, so I used the Netgear 4250 switches and, uh, and built a full on AVB Milan version of it. So I have two versions now, an unmanaged and a fully managed version. Um, okay. so yeah, yeah. So that's, that's kind of where we can start. <laughs> well, that's pretty impressive. So now, so now in regards to this box, is it configurable or you just sell it as a a piece that you just have to use it the way you want, or do you make it configurable for the client? How, is it off the shelf? How, do yeah, you, yeah, how does it work? Yeah, it's completely off the shelf. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's if, if you're running AVB, well, if you're running the unmanaged switches, then there is no configuration because unmanaged switches don't have any configuration. It's, uh, you know, doesn't have any green ethernet, doesn't have any, anything that's in the switches that are is going to get in the way of you going on with your show. So that's a, you know, let's call it a dumb switch, right? It's, it's a gigabit. And what I do is I build the infrastructure and everything inside the case. The cases are aluminum um, and, uh, and bring all the connections to the front using like nitric connectors, ether cons and power cons and all that, all the industry standard stuff, all the stuff that we're used to dealing with instead of, you know, broken RJ 45s and, you know, plastic hanging out. It's a robust kind of approach with the Netgear version with the AVB Milan version. Yeah. It has to be configurable because it's, it's, uh, it's a switch that they built that has multiple profiles. One day it can be used on an AVB system. The next day it can be used on a Dante system. You just have to upload a new profile into the switch. So all of that is still maintained and there's nothing removed or, or chopped off um, because of what I've done to it. And I've actually got direct connection with the guys at Netgear. They've been super helpful in this project because they see the value in what I'm doing, which is, you know, right. look at it this, look at it this way. There was a time, and I don't know when that time was, <clears throat> maybe you guys, maybe someone's older than me that remembers when you, when you basically ran out six extension cords instead of one power bar. You know? Yeah. 
and and that's that's kind of what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to give a give everybody like a grab and go utility that just gives them access to networking really simple and with a lot of guys these days you know you got your okay you got your a listers right you've got your IT you know propeller heads but on a factor of 10 you've got the guys below them the B level guys who don't have the chops that those uh, in in-house IT people have right and they're the ones that are out on the gig the IT guy still sitting back at the shop, you know, and so they're out there and they're wondering why nothing doesn't work. They can't get anything to work, right? And of course, we right. know guys who do shows know there's a myriad of reasons why something doesn't work within a network. What I did is I took away as many potential pitfalls as possible, um, so that there's a much clearer path to uh, to getting your network up and running. We just sold a bunch to Freeman AV. And, um, and, and, and they, you know, they're out, they're at South by Southwest. I mean, they're, they're using them all over, all over the place over there for that event. And the one single reason that they were wanting to use this was because it took a lot of questions away from their, their onsite staff They're You know what I mean? Like, it's like plug it in. It either works or it doesn't work. Not like you got a bad cable in the rack or somebody didn't patch it right. Or somebody's password protected something. This is the unmanaged versions they bought. So it's a really simple now, plug and play solution for them. Now, are these powered boxes or do, do they take the power from the inputs and the outputs? So it, How they, are you powering the, it? They come with power cons with through with power cons in and through. So the idea when you're using them with a the sound system is that you could harvest the power off of a cabinet because most of the powered speaker cabinets are using power con or top, you know, top connectors. Um, and then you feed that into the TCM first, which is up on the uh, up on the grid with the sound system, and then just daisy chain out of that with another power cable and just go right into the cabinet because the switches don't draw any any power, and then most of the time they're getting 15 amps or 20 amps on each cabinet circuit wise. So that just means you don't have to run any extra AC cables up to this up to the array if if we're talking about you know using it upstairs kind of thing. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, what would, go ahead. Chris, yeah, what would, uh, what would, okay, so if, if we're discussing the, the difference between the managed application and the unmanaged switch, so in the managed switch space, you were basically saying, well, if somebody's running Dante, they could have a profile, and if they're running Milan, they could have another profile. And like, in the managed, you know, in the managed version. Yes, in the managed version. Yeah, yeah. So what, yeah. what, what settings are getting fiddled with? Uh, in the managed version between profiles, what what kinds of things are you? Where where are the changes being made? Okay, so so this is a that's a great question. The answer is different, but it's a great question. Uh, the answer is I don't do anything personally. So Netgear is the one that came into it. So they have this this new series, the 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 forty two fifty, what they call the Pro AV series, and yeah, what they I'm, did I'm looking was at that, yeah. Yeah, what they did was they took a like a, uh, a a very focused approach to going after the audiovisual market, and they have this guy, this French guy. I can't remember what his name is off the top of my head now, but he's kind of the he's kind of like the the gearhead of the whole operation, and you know, kind of like Luminex, right? Like they 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 went after all of these protocols, and and so in a lot of respects, um, in terms of how the switches work. Um, they have a lot of similarities between their their kind of approaches. So what you would do, as an example, if you were doing a Dante gig today, you would you know you would patch yourself into the switch, get into its 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 uh, GUI, and you would simply go down and select Dante as a profile. Um, and then Netgear has already vetted out all of those basic settings with with the Dante protocol. And it will just automatically load that profile into the switch. And then you're good to go. You can go in and do additional management inside the switch because you have a full interface where you can go in. And, and if, you're, if your chops are together and you know how to set up your own VLANs and so on and so forth, you can go and go in and do any of that. But that, at the that very... Was, that, that was my next question. I mean, do you have any idea what they're fiddling with in that profile? Are they, are they running VLANs or are they, uh, is there spanning tree? I mean, do they have redundancy? I, think it, I, I really think it comes down to things like, you know, even things as simple as snooping and green ethernet and things like that. And, you know, Dante keeps, 
kind of expanding what their capabilities are too, right? So they, you know, when when I was first introduced in the Dante, it was a very simple, very straightforward kind of thing but they keep getting more complicated because they want to keep up with the joneses in terms of what their switches are capable of doing so um all i could tell you because i haven't dissected each and every profile is that the only thing that the profile does is put you in the safe space to be able to accurately and dependably use dante based on audinate's own protocols and that would be the same with AVB Milan. You know, you talk to Yamaha, you talk to various manufacturers, and they say, well, you know, to make sure you're safe, you want to set this to this and this to this and this to this. And that's what basically those profiles are doing. They're just putting in whatever the organization's suggested settings are as to how they would work within their own switches. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's, it, it's really meant to be that kind of a scenario just just load the profile and, and yeah, no, it, works, it, it you know? kind of sounds like they're 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 trying to just demystify exactly switching. you get my point you get my point uh, so it's 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 demystifying just load this profile and and plug shit in and it's going to work and that's and that's only half a promise <laughs> if you don't have a company that's not willing to stay up to date because things change right so as time goes on, what you thought was a good profile for AVB Milan a year ago may not be current anymore. And so they put together this small team within Netgear. Um, I don't know if it's not if it's more than 20 or 30 people. And that's a business class switch company. So you can imagine how many employees they actually have. Um, but these guys are like hyper focused just on this one particular you know, range of products, which is dealing directly with the AV industry. They're showing up at our trade shows, you know, Infocom and, uh, you know, all of the others. And, and, and they're actually interfacing with people there on the show site. And then to your, to your answer that you said, the next layer then comes to me. And that's what I did. So you said it makes a simple plug and play from their aspect by loading up a specific profile. And I say, yeah, I took that one step further by, by further simplifying it by giving you all industry standard connections in a, in a robust utility type enclosure that you can use on many different things in your show. You don't have to build racks anymore. You don't have to do that kind of stuff. You just take it off the shelf. It's going to work. Gotcha. Okay. Kurt, what happened? Kurt. <laughs> Whose background is he using uh, tonight? I want to know. Yeah, Probably I was just going to say he's got uh, oh, yeah, his client fucked up and didn't get us our rooms where we're supposed I... to be. So I'm at a goddamn best Western. Nice. <laughs> goddamn Art best western and used to mean used to mean something here today is an opinion Art the goddamn 26 foot truck in a parking lot full of punters like jesus christ best western used to mean something <laughs> yeah. used the doors it was the 70s but it used to mean something the door as long hey, as the we'll, doors face in i can live with it doors out i'm we'll out. keep the lights oh, on for night. you kurt we'll keep the yeah, lights well, on yeah, we'll it's keep the light on for you doors, in, out, in. doors out i'm out well, we'll know you're entertained once I see uh, someone else's background come up on your screen. That's all I'm waiting for. I'm celebrating the glorious Best Western background. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful background, too. I love it. You know? Yeah. So I probably it, missed most of what I wanted to know, but whatever. <laughs> no, you haven't missed anything yet that you want to know. Now is now's the time to ask your question. So well, he's already on. he's already talked to me several times. Kurt and I have, have, yeah. have worked together several times on on discussing this. But I, you know, I this is literally the very first time that I've actually gone on online or anything with a with any for any shape or form to talk about this. You know, I go to trade shows and I have a lot of banter there. Um, I do my little obviously my social media stuff, but I really never put myself in a position for a Q and A. And I just really think that it's important are really important to have more dialogue in this stuff because what I did and what I continue to do is 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 not something that's proprietary. It's not something that was um, uh, you know um, thrown together really hastily. It was the result of a huge amount of time on the road, you know, dealing with the brothers and sisters and the frustrations of networking and just kind of standing back and going, man, we're just missing something like something something is just missing from this whole equation we've done amazing things with with power connections and racks and distribution panels and we've done amazing things with analog with amphenol connectors and all military spec stuff and then you go to network and it's like yeah not so much um 
and and that's really what the genesis of it was was give the industry something that they really need the problem is jan and guys is that the industry doesn't even realize that they need it yet right they don't realize it because you don't know what you don't know if you've never had the stuff and used it then you really don't know how it changes your day how it makes things easier and 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 stuff because nobody else makes anything like it i'm the first person to do something like this with networks so until there's enough of them out in the field and and stage hands and people are getting their hands on them um, and and kind of getting that realization of, oh, this this couldn't be easier. That's mm-hmm. it's going to take that time to start to get the traction. You you have to be um, you have to you'll know once you start using the stuff, because I've been using it for a couple of years. Right. Well, I'd like to I'd like to have Ken Porter's opinion on something and maybe he's got a question for you or anything he could add into this. How do you deal with heat in the box in the uh, sealed uh, aluminum box? So the uh, I don't actually on the very surface of it, the the, the first, I guess the first 25 percent of the answer to the question. Um, I currently don't. The internal switches, uh, the AVB Milan ones, which are the only ones that get hot, the unmanaged switches just don't anyway because they're 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 doing jack squat in terms of processing. The uh, AVB Milan ones get warm, um, but currently the max temperature, which we would call the shutdown temperature of the Netgear switches is 77C. So we're talking north of 160, closer to 170 degrees Fahrenheit inside the case before the switches are going to start to to believe they're going thermal. Um, so what I did was, and and you know, like I said, the AVB Milan thing came came after the unmanaged switches were first and in the interim while i was kind of investigating this and trying to think forward about things like heat and and stuff like that and i threw this up uh, i threw a photo of it up and on the page um i came up with this thing that i just loosely call gatorback which is a uh, bent aluminum diamond plate which is like highly polished and so it uses like the same accessory track that you can put over the top of the TCMs if they're sitting up on top of your rig. And one of the best ways to stop things from heating is reflecting. So if we can reflect a lot of the sunlight off the top of the case, then that's a lot of heat that's not going in there. Plus the cases are aluminum, which dissipates heat and doesn't contain heat like steel cases do. Do you have any heat sinks on the aluminum case? No, the case itself is a heat sink. You know, so it it basically will just radiate heat off. And I'm and I'm only speculating on this because we've never seen it hot enough to even warrant a question. And I've had it out on many shows. Um, the unmanaged one sat for two complete summers sitting out on top of the EAW stuff for sound image in Napa. And we never had one issue with any temperatures. So I think the best way to to say that is I have I mean, I'm always trying to forward think, right? I'm trying to think of where the plot holes could be. And I'm constantly thinking of new ideas and things that I can do to further improve on the product if necessary. That's why I never even put that gator back thing on up in pictures or anything before, because I really don't think it's necessary. Um, But if you're in an extreme situation, let's say you're in Phoenix or you're in Abu Dhabi or you're in some massively hot area, at least I have the designs in place to be able to do additional cooling of the boxes should it become necessary. That now, be- is there a standard <laughs> configuration of these boxes or in other words, um, how many ins or how many outs or is, is that how you sell the product based on how many ins and outs you need? Well, the, the, everything starts off with the, with the case size. So that was the one thing that I had to lock in place was, uh, basically the width and height of the case, because if you have you ha- if you don't maintain the form factor, then your accessories can't move around, right? So the case had to be of a particular size, and that is basically for I have two versions of TCM. One's a double, which is a you know a dual redundant configuration where you have a left and a right side, two switches, and then I recently introduced a single switch version for guys who are doing like permanent installations and things like that, or maybe don't need the full, the full Monty kind of thing. Right. And uh, so basically in terms of, of patching configurations, it is whatever the switch manufacturer provided. So in the case of the unmanaged versions, you have eight usable ports 
times two for the for the the dual redundant model, and for the Netgear AVB versions, there is uh, I believe it's nine or ten usable ports for each switch, um, plus an what they call an OOB port, which is an out of band port for programming and and stuff like that. So. I don't try to reinvent the wheel. I'm not. I'm not actually in, in inputting any changes into the way the, of the functionality of the switches in any way, shape, or form. What I did was basically encase it in a in a package that was more user friendly than than a you know something in a cardboard box and a bunch of cables that you then have to put together in a rack and and do all that kind of stuff. So basically, you haven't written any. There's no proprietary software. But so is there a secret sauce? To what I'm doing? Yes. The secret. If, if there's a secret Don't sauce. Don't give it away funny. now. Don't give it away. No, 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 no. no. Mystery. So, so let's be clear, right? So I took someone else's electronics and I put it in a case. Doesn't sound too complicated, right? It's like anybody can do that. But point is, nobody did. And so how do I protect the IP? I guess is is how you would you would throw it out there. I, I don't really intend to protect the IP in a in a in a legal fashion or anything like that. Of what I've done, you really can't. It's like it's like trying to protect the layout of speakers in a speaker cabinet. You know, you can't you can't. Somebody else is going to do it eventually, and and hopefully more people do do it because it would just validate you know the original kind of approach I took. But I will go on to say that there is nothing that's standardized inside of the case. So you might think, well, I can just buy a bunch of Neutra connectors and I can just do this and do that. And I could have the same thing. Well, you can have the same functionality, but it'll never be able to fit in the size, the, the condensed package that I've built. Um, and it probably won't be as strong because that's where I put my emphasis on size and strength and, and weight, trying to keep it lightweight. Um, that's where it'll kind of, hold its own and the fact that I keep adding to the ecosystem, I keep adding accessories and I keep adding parts. You might get a brand or a company, a company out there that may say, Hey, well, let's, let's all hope and pray that, you know, he's making a lot of money selling those things. He's, he's selling a lot of those things. We should just jump in and we should make one too. Cause that's what our company does. And they'll probably make one, like they'll probably make the thing that I'm selling, but they probably will not go across and spend the time and energy it takes to build out all the accessories and all the things that go go along with it. And I and I think that that's where it'll hold its own. Right. I think you're talking about the Amazon model, where once you start <laughs> selling it, Amazon says, "Well, I can do that better than you." I'm and talking about the uh, business model. That's what everybody does. Yeah. You know, it's everybody yeah. plays a wait and see game. And uh, especially when somebody comes up with something that's different, you know, if I was going to build a line array tomorrow, you yeah, whatever. Right. But, you know, you come out with a, an incredibly unique thing and, and somebody takes notice, but that doesn't mean they're going to do anything. You know, this is, this is 2024. It's the years, it's the years of shareholders and they're going right. to sit back and they're going to watch and they're going to see if there's money in it. And if they see a lot of sales and stuff, then then they'll pull the trigger and jump on that gravy train. But they'll let guys like me take take the the bashes on the head <laughs> all the way, have all these conversations, do all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, when it gets some traction, that's when they'll just jump in and make a version. That's what I'm, that's my I, feeling. I hear you. Now, do you make one that is like, let's just say, um, rack mountable for like installs? Yeah, it was so that was just I just showed it at uh, the NAV show. Kurt saw it actually. We were sitting at the table. He saw it there. <laughs> so, yeah. So the the original one is a dual, so it's kind of big, right? But it was still half space. So that was one of the key things in the beginning was I wanted it to be half space because I wanted to be able to put other modules beside one beside the other, and. And then as I was, as the original was out and I was talking to people, of course, now I've got, I've got a reason to talk about this stuff. Um, you know, people started coming back to me and saying, you know, it'd be really cool, man, if you could, you could rack mount that. And I, and I, and I would say kind of tongue in cheek, you know, yeah, you can rack mount them, but it's like four spaces high, you know? And so, and then I had further dialogues after the AVB version release where people were saying, well, you know, for installations and things, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to pay for 20 ports when each of the arrays is only like six cabinets. Right. So and that made a lot of sense to me. And so I went back and I did a design for uh, a single switch 
AVB version, which is the obviously the same Netgear switch. And, and, and I all but uh, sat on the thing <laughs> to make sure that it stayed within two spaces high and it's half rack. So that is that, that functional prototype I brought to NAM and showed it around to a bunch of people. Uh, I think the response was, was good. It, it, it kind of like rounds out the package, you know, it, it, it allows you to scale easily for your project. And um, so that's still coming. Um, that's that design's finished, but of course, you know, moving into production and stuff. And I'll I'll respond to the market in terms of um, you know how fast we we kind of light that thing up. One of the unique things about my company is that I make everything myself here in in, uh, in Las Vegas. So I don't have any. Well, I don't make the switches. I don't make the connectors, but I build the cases and I do all the assembly, I do the powder coating, I, I, I do the whole construction. So I created Truth and Audio to be like a tiered uh, scenario, you know, start off small, if you know how to build them yourself, if you can buy the machines to do it yourself, do it that way. If something gets traction, then I'm prepared to move on to third party vendors, where then I can move it out and have instead of dozens, I can have hundreds or thousands. Um, but if something doesn't work out, and it's just not getting traction, and I want to kind of fold it up and put that away, then, then I haven't been devastated by, you know, minimum order quantities that most manufacturers want to see if you're going to, you know, get them to fire up their presses and machines to do such things. So now my last question, well, I'm, I might be lying here. I might, I might have more yeah, questions so you want. But right now, <laughs> but right now, is there, is there a, a minimum and a maximum of a type of system that you're looking for? Or what is, what is your sweet spot of, what type of uh, environment you want to be in? Is it, you know, uh, like, for example, in the Panther system, how many boxes? It, could it be a larger system or a smaller system? Where is your sweet spot? What do you, who is, who is the, who Who's the is customer? your target market right now? Who is your so target that was, other than Kurt and, and <laughs> Porter? That so, was and much they're both here in the room. And you they're know? both here in the room. Um, and we ain't letting them out. And um, so in the beginning, that was kind of easy because I only had the one version with the unmanaged switches. So that was, it was like a one shot deal. And that whole concept of, of TCM is kind of blown out exponentially in terms of, of how many different parts and interfaces and things like that. And, and so we're only scratching the surface here because AVB, as an example, carries right on into lighting. So we don't we don't even have to stop at just audio. I was at CES last year and I, I was talking to broadcast people and they're saying, holy shit, we don't have anything like this in the market. You know, like this lunch pail kind of scenario for when they're out doing like remote shoots and things like that, that they could just tell a guy to go drop this 500 feet away and so on and so forth. So so there is no there is no um, target per se. I, it can scale itself all the way down to, you know, the single switch version, which is, you know, 10 ports. And, um, and you could keep adding them together. They even, they even hang from each other. So you can even hang one under another and, and scale it that way. But obviously audio is my, my, you know, my jam It's what I know the most about. And it's where I feel like an interface in, in, you know, in, in a, in the best way to customers. And when it comes to like the Panther rig and stuff, um, you know, for the guys who are not using networking, they're daisy chain, right? So they're, they're they're using analog and they're going into one cabinet and then loop into the next cabinet, loop into the next cabinet, loop into the next cabinet. Um, with the with TCM and the networking part of it, uh, you would be doing a star topology from the network. So basically, you'd be coming out on a multi, and then you know each box gets its own direct port connection to back to the switches, and um, and then you wouldn't have that cascading failure. If something, if a cable goes bad, like in a daisy chain, as you know, if the cable goes bad, everything below that cable is gone. That's it. And you can't fix it when it's 40, 50 feet up in the air. Um, mm -hmm. With a star topology, even though it's a network star topology, um, you would lose that one, that one enclosure. That one cable goes bad, one enclosure goes down, and mm -hmm. the rest of them continue to work. So there's, there's a bit of safety there, although I wish that the ABB Milan stuff all had redundancy like the, like the Dante stuff. Um, it doesn't, at least the Meyer stuff doesn't, but it's a very robust network is what I've learned. So uh, uh, Bernard, I, regrettably, I have to go. I 
direct a message to you, my uh, name and telephone and email. Oh, I'd love okay. to uh, get together. So if you could be kind enough to give me a ring at your yeah, leisure. Yeah, we can, uh, yeah. yeah. Further. yeah we'll talk more about motorcycles. Out? And Kurt, how did well, you I was hoping open? that you'd have. I was hoping that you'd, you know, you you would give him one zinging question that would leave him, you know, his, his ears burning, you know. But uh, well, it's, you got to go. It. I mean, it, it, it's essentially what it's. So yeah, I mean, it it it. I I, I understand the paradigm. Uh, I, I get it because you know switches can get yeah. very complex depending on what you're trying to do. And I just want to yeah. And I just want to leave you with one thought. What I, I would leave anybody with this thought. If there was anybody in the world who never wanted to do anything like this, it's me. You know, <laughs> I, I I didn't want to have one when when we first started working on Anya at EAW and it was all network. I'm like, dude, I can barely get my computer to log on to the internet. You know, and so I'm a speaker guy. I've always been a speaker guy, but I but I found such a huge need in this market for something like this that it, it was just compelling me to, you know, you, you got to get this out there. You got to get this out there. And like I said, I'm sure the more people that get their hands on it and start using it and, and sure you're going to have some people with a little fear factor about temperatures and things like that. Well, the same rules apply to the speaker cabinets that are being hung there too. They're self-powered. They're, they're encased in wood, which is obviously a really good insulator, right? Um, they get just as hot as anything else. So we're always in that world of of what ifs and stuff. And what does the Meyer Panther shut down at? Anybody know? Like, is it, how many degrees will a, a Panther amplifier go to before it goes into thermal? It's it's all the same deal. At least I have other products and ideas that if that becomes an issue, um, and I don't expect anybody to be a guinea pig because that's why I'm saying it's 170 degrees F. Um, but if I got to go, a, gentlemen. Thank yeah, yeah. you. Sorry. Take care. All right. Thank you. If it becomes an issue, um, I have I have things and and ways to address the let's say the radical temperature problems that may occur. Not definitely don't have to worry about the average temperatures. It's not going to be a problem. I've got some questions. <laughs> so. <Who dat? laughs> oh, Kurt. I guess I'll start with, so what are people, obviously people have been using network audio and P, large scale PA prior to this product. What have they been doing and what's wrong with it? Um, what they've been doing is what I've actually been able to be very, very close to. And, you know, that was kind of the genesis of the whole thing is what everybody else is doing. And when we, so here's the natural kind of go-to for, since we're talking sound systems in general, the go-to is keep everything on the ground, put it in racks, and run network cables up to the PA, right? Seems totally straightforward. And it and for and for the most part, it is. But you're already replacing that single NL8 cable that you used to be able to use. Now you have to send up power and you have to send up network and you have to send up all that kind of stuff. And that and that extra you know baggage let's say all that cable that you have to pack and vet and keep control of is is basically an exponential curve once you get into larger arrays my uh, my uh commitment let's call it to keeping the network switches local to the sound system is meant to clean up the stage it's meant to clean up the patch it's meant to have repeatability and consistency because wherever the array is, the network is, you know, because obviously you don't always get to put your racks where you want them on shows, right? And eliminates what could be road cases full of cable that are really not necessary. You know, when we were touring with Petty, um, with the Anya rig, we had giant road cases full of multi-pin network cables that all had to go up every day, up, down, up, down, up, down. And we were hanging the racks behind the PA. Uh, on the second tour, we hung them behind the PA it just never ever it never seemed right it was always it always felt kludgy it never felt clean and tidy um and then when i brought out the first kind of prototype tcms and started trying them out with sound image guys and stuff because they had on in their inventory i was um i was just blown away by how simple it went together and how, and how few cables it required um there was just there was just no other option that I could think of that was going to be slicker, more dependable, and easier and more intuitive to set up and tear down 
than just putting the switches local to the arrays. There was just nothing. I tried everything. Um, but for those diehards, you know, that, that say, you know, I really just prefer to have my shit and racks on the ground. They probably wouldn't be using a self-powered PA anyway, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but let's just say it's just my network. Then, then fine. You can mount it on the ground. You can put it in a rack. That's why I built them in half space sizes like that. So you could still default to a rack if you really, really, really wanted to. I don't see the need for it. I think it's more complicated. It's more capable and more cable that's introduced. But hey, if that's if that's your jam, I'm not trying to change, you know, someone's opinion on on where they should put their stuff. Well, I haven't used amp racks in 20 something years. So mm -hmm. it's not where I'm headed at all. I don't want to do that. In but racks, I yeah. Use, I don't the less racks, I don't have any racks. I have cases. <laughs> I right. don't really need racks for anything that has to do with the PA except for a distro. Right. Um, so my concern, I mean, I think you've kind of addressed the heat concern that unfortunately I probably expressed, <laughs> but. I don't uh, think it's unfortunate at all. I, I think it's actually good. I mean, these, these, these things have to be, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm talking to a, most people. I, I don't know anybody here. And yeah. that's why I'm, I'm, I'm taking this opportunity to go open for them so I can get all kinds of random questions, but also have the opportunity to address them um immediately so people don't get the wrong idea you know like something is or, or is what it is i'd rather it came i'd rather i screw up my own story <laughs> you know yeah, well, my own foot my own mouth you know 170 fahrenheit i mean i think if we like particularly in my band organ thing where the ambient can be 99 to 100 degrees right and you know so you i think we could get to the 120 130 140 inside that box after all day um but with 170 i can i can feel more comfortable about that i mean one of my issues is i'm much more interested in the data than i am mm -hmm. in driving the pa with digital signal i'm yeah. much more interested in monitoring what the fan speeds and the temperatures and voice coil and all that but that's what i really care about well i mean that's what you care about and but you but but by default you get the digital audio too so you right, get it all in my particular infrastructure um that I don't want to criticize because it was created prior to really widespread Milan uh, system driving is that um, the signals are present in both locations. If you are running it with the Milan and you have channel one as your upper two boxes on the left side of the PA. So those that same routing patching and signal is going to be available on XLR analog output one. Mm -hmm. and you can't mute it right so the idea of having an analog backup that's the same as what you're doing as far as boxes and beam steering low mid beam steering and those kinds of things that are you know part of what your plan would be whether you're committed to analog or committed to the milan in either scenario you can drive it that way but to have an analog backup that you can switch to immediately because you can't mute it. So the, the amplifier is going to see both analog and the digital in at the same time. Obviously, yeah. the digital is going to be late. So there's going to be a big comb filter parked in your PA. With the infrastructure that I'm using, there's no way to mute the analog until you need it. So you can't simply run both versions up there. You can have one XLR that drives the whole PA, which is your second parachute to keep you from dying when you splatter on the pavement. But it's not going to be what the guy just mixed the first half of the show on before the network failed. So, yeah, and I, you know what? I don't, I don't claim to be a Meyer expert in the way that they've they've kind of configured the 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 digital versus analog world to work. What I was told was that yeah, you're correct. The analog and digital is is running simultaneously, and the analog would be patched out of like a matrix output on the console as your backup. And you would have that obviously turned down um, while you were using the digital audio. And then should you lose network for any reason, then you would throw the analog in to compensate for it. Um, I can't believe that they wouldn't have some sort of a latency compensation, though. I mean, you're, you're saying that there's a there there's a you know, there's a time difference between the digital and the analog. I would have expected them to build in a, a latency onto the digital side so that it continued to match analog. Or well, vice versa. You'd have to delay the analog. 
I had to delay the analog. Yeah. I can't, I can't I imagine have, that they. I might have had that kind of disruption along the way, but uh, uh, no, no, I don't no know. Has, no one has brought that to my attention. And the thing is, you'd have to have a way to mute sixteen channels simultaneously of analog, so that you need a device to go through that simply lives there to mute it, or you need a completely sec secondary uh, drive system that's simply a backup. And to get that secondary drive system just to be there as a backup that's you know looped in so it's fed the same inputs um but you mute the inputs and uh and only open those up and kill the inputs to the first device if uh if the network fails so that's that device alone that just sits there in case something ever happens is like twice what your product costs in the first place so the, the backup for something to maybe go wrong someday is twice as expensive as as you know what your offering and don't get me wrong i thought it was a great thing i can personally speak for the build quality having there sitting there looking at it it's very well built so i have no issues with any of that stuff i'm just trying to get my brain around what happens if it goes bad how do i, I recover and i realize that it's a little bit hypocritical probably because i'm a self-powered pa guy and i've already got my amps flying 40 feet in the air so the idea that putting another thing 40 feet in the air yeah, some practical away. kind of considerations. Yeah, it doesn't so here's the, necessarily here's the, make sense. Here's the other thing too: is that um, I've been an audio, like a PA network guy, since like I said, 2013. Right. So, so every single I'm only speaking for the adaptive stuff because I never, I never ran Meyer, I never ran the others, but arguably Audinate and Dante were we're probably not at the same developmental level as, as AVB Milan. Right. So, so it, 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 they're all doing a pretty good job now. I don't know who is in, in what aspect of the race, but I do know that at least according to Meyer and other people that I've talked to that use AVB Milan, their interpretation is it's a far more robust network system than Dante was, which is why these brands don't seem to worry about only sending one network signal and not running a, a an, an honest to god you know digital backup like Audney. and the analog is there as a holy shit what if which even the adaptive stuff from EAW has there's even an analog circuit in there so 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 I I left EAW at the beginning of 2018 so for five straight years you know out touring with Tom Petty and Blink 182 and um uh you know um Maroon 5 and all these guys packing, you know, 48 plus 56 cabinets, every single one of them running off network. Not one single cabinet in any of those tours or shows ever saw an analog signal. I never saw the thing come off primary. Never once did I see the Dante stuff come off primary. Well, meaning that, that we had failed. no failures. The petty rig failed in Seattle. Ah, but that was a whole, there was a story for that. That wasn't the network per se. That wasn't the network. Um, I was there. <laughs> I was standing right there. I was actually part of that problem um, in in the fact that, so here's what happened. In case you guys heard, the, heard what happened, but never knew the story. So obviously big, big Anya rig. We had um, a bunch of Anna's that were brought in to do the, the delay ring for the, for the stadium. And uh, everything was going swimmingly. I mean, we were having a killer show. And at one point, Vic Wagner, who was the lead systems engineer, and we have Matt McQuaid up on the stage. Um, he said that he was walking around the, you know, in, in the delay rings and he heard some crackling going on in one of the columns. Right. So, you know, we're we're speculating. The the Anis came from another rental company. They had their own setup and everything, but everything seemed to be fine as far as their equipment was concerned. And so we were left with, okay, well, we got a little crackling going on back there. Um, what do you think we should we should be doing? So we're having a little powwow and stuff. And Vic said, he said, Well, what if I send all the settings to the PA again? Because you remember with that adaptive stuff, you have to send all the settings to the PA or it just shoots straight out. It doesn't, it doesn't know what the hell it's doing. So not a big deal. I've done it dozens and dozens of times, you know, in the middle of a show, send the settings to the system. It doesn't burp or fart or do anything. It just, it just keeps going. So no big deal. 
And so we're speculating, you know, I wasn't fully convinced I wanted to do it because it's Tom fucking Petty and which is different than, you know, maybe a festival or whatever, you know, small daytime thing. This is a pretty big deal, you know, 35,000 people. But I said, look, man, I'm going to leave it up to you. If you, if you, if you think you want to do it, just let's see what happens. Wasn't freaking out or nothing. I'm like, I just want to make sure that I've done my due diligence and said, I, I got to leave the buck with you because I probably wouldn't, but it's okay. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it. So he goes up to the computer. He recalculates the whole model um, and hits the fucking go button. Immediately the PA turns off, right? So we know what caused it, whatever he just did, <laughs> right? So it wasn't a network failure. The, the whatever he just did and whatever he just told the PA to do just turned it off. And so obviously, you know, jaws hit the floor. Everyone's aghast. We don't, cause we don't have a frigging clue as to what just happened. Not a clue, but we know we just did it because it was simultaneous to the push of that button. So Vic's freaking out. He gets on the radio He's going to Matt. He's going, Matt, you know, check this, blah, 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 check this, check that. And it didn't take very long before he realized as he's looking at the, because the the software for the EAW stuff will list all your Dante devices. Like it'll show you all the speaker cabinets and their Mac addresses, and it'll show you anything else that's hooked up to the network, right? There's no Lake LMs on the network even though the lakes are what we're using for Dante on ramps into the PA, but they're not showing up in the software. And we're going, where are the lakes, right? The PA is all there. It's all still there flashing. We're all here. We're all good. Don't know what you just did, but we're all here, but no lakes. And we're going, what the absolute hell. And so we radio up to Matt on stage and we said, <laughs> this is the funniest part. We go, Matt, Matt, you got to you gotta power, recycle the power on the lakes. We can't see them on the network. They're gone, right? And so Matt's like, you know, holy shit, man. These, you know, As you know, the lakes don't have a power button. They have a standby button, which means that he's got to get in the back of the rack to be able to cycle the IEC plug to actually shut it off and turn it back on again. And so he... He did that. He pulled the plugs on the LMs, LM44s, plugged them back in. Within like 10 seconds, bloop, bloop, LMs come up in the software. Vic hits the fucking go button again. How? PA's back on. We're back in business. So what ended up, what happened was, <clears throat> for whatever reason, um, the LMs, the, the Lake LMs, fell off the network without us knowing. We didn't, you know, obviously there's 56 freaking network connections there just for the just for the full range cabinets. So trying to see two little Lake LM44s in that whole mix of MAC addresses is, you know, is not super intuitive. So what happened was they had fallen off the network, and I still to this day don't know why. But when he pushed the settings to the PA, the the, the settings were expecting to send them the settings to the LM44s because that's what they had been dubbed as the input right lm44s so it shot off the settings but they didn't go anywhere because there were no lm44s on the network so it just shot it in the fucking zero one space and that's what turned the pa off because it didn't have a destination for the audio inputs and as soon as the lakes showed back up again on the network we were able to repush the settings and and get the pa back up and running again so um yeah, it was just one of those things where you well, did, the it network bring down the, did it bring down the monitor rig as well, or just the front of house rig? Just the front of house. Yeah, just the front of house. And it wasn't a, literally, and so the band kept playing, and I guess he they just did an instrumental until yeah. you can get the uh, PA yeah. back. Yeah, and 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 huge kudos to those guys, man. Like Vic and and Matt. Like I mean, like talk about sharp as attack, right? Like. You know, you know the you know the amount of, of equipment these guys are using and the level at which they're operating and the pressure. You know, we're at thirty five thousand people and it's Tom fucking Petty. You know, uh, and cool as cucumbers, right? 
Oops. That would have rattled a lot of people's brains for a minute because, you know, and Vic being able to identify what the problem was and get it right the first time, the lakes are not on the network. And, and to just run after that, I thought was brilliant. You know, it shit happens, you know, I mean, shit really happens. But in this case, um, there would have, there, there was no precedent for it because we had never, we had never encountered that issue before. And it wasn't us. It wasn't EAW. It wasn't the network per se. It was the lakes. The lakes fell off the network. The network didn't kick them off. They just disappeared off the network. And honestly, no, no slag against those guys, but I've never used the lake as a, an LM44 is an on-ramp ever from that day forward. I've always gone to like focus right or something else if I need to do that stuff. I just didn't trust it. So it wasn't a well, network let me, failure. Let me... It was yeah. a failure of a device on the network. And I think this is part of what like copper, and I mean actual copper, not what people call copper now, which is a little ethernet cord. That's not copper. Copper is the 56 channel RAM latch. Right. So that's not going to fail unless you run over it with a forklift. And it's just my, my hang up with the whole thing. And, and again, it's not even really your product. I think your product at the end of the chain is actually one of the, based on my looking at it and holding it in my hands, that's one of the most robust physically um, capable parts of, of that yeah. kind of infrastructure. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. It's tough. Yeah. Having addressed the heat thing, I, I don't really see the the end of the chain being a much of a, a potential failure point. Yeah. But to use the digital drive, I've got to have a switch in front of house, and then I got to have a switch on stage, and then another switch on the other side of the stage that's fed from the first switch. So I'm introducing all of these potential points of failure that I just don't have in a true analog drive system. Right. Yeah. No, I totally get it. I mean, mostly it's, it's like, because I want to see the data. I want to see the data. Yeah. I, I mean, we all, like I said, at the very beginning of the conversation, we all kind of pine for still just plugging in an NL8 cable or an NL4 cable, you know, because it was so simple and and reliable. Um, but the world moves on, you know, and technology moves on. And, uh, you know, you, I would like to feel like this, this, these are easy choices to make. They're not because as manufacturers, and I was part of that, um, didn't necessarily make it super simple, did we? <laughs> you know, and I've talked to other principals of other PA companies, you know, that I'm friendly with, and they have even said themselves, you know, we're not good at networks. And what they mean by that is that that's not their focus. Their focus is to build great speaker cabinets and their focus is to build great sound systems. And I think that fundamentally every Every single lecturer who's done network sound systems has approached the networking infrastructure as an afterthought. It's the it's the it's at the very end of the chain, right? And now everybody wants to get the PA out, and everybody wants to get it out, and get it moving. And somebody goes, "Well, has anybody really thought about how people interface with this shit? How they hook it up? How how messy is it? How clean is it? You know, has anybody done that?" And um, and I have one company principal from a brand say, "We're fucking horrible at that shit." <laughs> you know, and I think that that's where a lot of the fear comes from, you know, this, this kind of compounded fear that that a lot of people have with networks is that um, it never really was physically addressed right from the get go. It was a lot of extra cables, there was a lot of head scratching, you know, with Dante, there was always the possibility that you would switch cables and have reverse patches going on, you know, crisscrossing networks and causing all sorts of issues. And there was never really an intuitive approach from the beginning to say, hey, there's no there's no extra complexity here. You know, it's intuitive. You just maybe got to make a couple extra connections, but we've labeled them properly. It's easy. It's repeatable and reliable. I can attest to the reliable part, you know, because I've been around this for a minute. Um, I would never suspect reliability issues by running a network is what I'm saying. So the simple fact of running a network doesn't put you in any jeopardy. The interconnects of that network are where the problems typically arise. You know, bad connections, bad cables, yeah. things, things because, of that nature. Because you know, technology does move forward. That doesn't necessarily mean it's always moving in a in a better direction. Just because it's newer doesn't 
necessarily. I didn't, I, I, I didn't say I didn't add that it was better. I said it's moving <laughs> forward because I'm an old analog guy through and through, and I love my old PAs and my old shit. You know, I mean, I love all that stuff. But I, I, as as like I said in 2012 when I was first introduced, I wasn't given any fucking choice. We're going that way. And Robert uh, Scoville will say the same thing. He said to me one day, he goes, you know, sooner or later, you just got to throw yourself at the technology because it ain't stop. It's a train that's not stopping. Oh, I, I guess know that's what my point was. Yeah. I mean, but so I, that was my point. Interesting that Robert is now over at EAW, you know. So well, isn't that yeah. weird? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. I thought that was a great p- place from the land because, you know, uh, he he was and and still is an ambassador for that that group of products you know like he put his money where his mouth was he went out and he toured it and and stuff it was it was much easier to see him in the walls of eaw than say D B or adamson or something you know what i mean um well i wish him only the best of luck and and i really appreciate what you you know what you brought today yeah uh, to you know to our to our zoom cast um is, do you have a website where people can find you yeah yeah it's just simply truth and and um, we're doing an overhaul on the site with a bunch of new pictures and stuff. The the the, the descriptions are good uh, in in kind of explaining what the paradigm, what the ecosystem is. But there's been you know uh, advancements and modifications and stuff to the products as we've developed them over the over the last couple of years because we've been field testing these things for like two years just to make sure oh, because cool. of you know Kurt's concerns and any and and Ken's concerns that this shit will do what it's intended to do. I don't want to put something out there that's going to fail your show put it that way great excellent well listen yeah. we are going to we're, what we're going to do is say goodbye to those people that are watching us live although i believe we had a hiccup somehow in the live but we recorded the whole thing and we'll be replacing the yeah. live feed with the recorded feed uh, and nobody will be any of the wiser except i just <laughs> told you yeah so yeah. with that in mind remember you know everything you heard today was an opinion but before we go even though we've been on quite a while does anybody have anything else they want to say before we say goodbye to uh, the uh, the live audience and just talk amongst ourselves? That was great. Okay, good. With... Oh, good, Wayne. Good. I was just going to say that was great listening today. I, I quite enjoyed that. Thanks, uh, Listening to Bernie about the – and I had lots of questions, but I couldn't – I wouldn't ask them on the – that take well, too long. Well, you're going to gonna stay with us, and we'll, you uh-huh. can ask those questions later. And those people who want you can DM you and find out what your questions were. Unbelievable. So remember, with remember what I always say: you make it happen. I can't believe I'm about to say this, but next week is going to be our 200th Zoomcast. 200, unbelievable. <laughs> so we'll see you next Wednesday. Just remember, hey. You must be kidding me. Unbelievable. So and with that in mind, remember, you make it happen. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next week. And again, everything you heard today is opinion, so do your own research. Take care. Be safe. Bye, everybody. And uh, we are off the air.